Okay, so we can uh, begin the uh, next session. And um, the next uh, lecture in this summer school is going to be given by Professor Leonid Mirny, who, uh, whose office, his everyday office is across the street from here. If you peer from here, you can probably see it. Um, but he is on sabbatical leave at uh, Ecole Normale in Paris. And so he's going to give his talk by Zoom. Uh, Leonid is a professor of physics and also a core member of the Institute for Medical Engineering Science at MIT. And he really has uh, done some of the seminal work on understanding chromatin structure and dynamics and so forth with special emphasis on how he has informed the interpretation as well as guided high sea experimentation, which you will hear much about from Job Decker, I'm sure, later in this meeting. So without further ado, Leonid, you have um, 60 minutes. And given the example I have set, uh, 61 minutes, I will start applauding like, uh, like- uh, Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> like, Joel Lebowitz, like Joel Lebowitz oh. at Rutgers Tatris meeting, okay? So that's All right, okay, that's, no, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure uh, talking to you guys. Uh, I apologize for doing this over Zoom. It's actually good that we planned the Zoom ahead of time because I ended up having COVID this week. So I would be over Zoom anyways. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm feeling fine now, but anyway. So, so I'll tell you, I'll give you some overview of the work in my group uh, in chromosome organization. I, I can somehow hear myself. I don't know how to fix this, uh, but I'll, I'll take care of it on my side. So if you have a question, maybe the moderator can type it because I will have to turn off sound from your side. Um, okay, so I'll tell you about work in my group. And in particular, I'll, um, I'll try to communicate this kind of our current understanding of uh, mechanisms that organize chromosomes and try to think about uh, the trying to think about their functional role. Uh, and uh, the summary of what I'll be uh, talking about today is essential that we believe that one of the mechanisms that's essential for chromosome organization and that, that we worked on extensively, loop extrusion, may actually have a function of facilitating long range genomic interactions. And as such, essentially serves as a genome communication system. And there are actually many interesting parallels between communication systems and loop extrusion that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, and then the second mechanism that is closer to the subject of, of our loops presentation, generally the interest in condensates, uh, the second uh, kind of broad mechanism of a class of mechanisms and phenomena in, chromos in large scale chromosome organization are called compartmentalization. And we argue that in fact, these mechanisms might be important for the maintenance of epigenetic memory. Uh, surprisingly enough. So, so that would turn essentially a chromosome into some sort of a, a memory machine. Um, so, so let's, let's use this, let's go into the, into the data. Um, I will be talking largely about genomic data and only a little bit, well, I will actually mention some, some microscopy data and even some force measurements um, uh, was as a quick advertisement of some new approaches. I will mention some, some of our ongoing work here in France uh, on the force on the force measurements on chromosomes, but the main tool so far have been uh, data from Chi C. Again, I I'm sure most of you are familiar with this data. So these are huge maps of pairwise contact frequencies between all genomic loci. These are really fantastic data. They have seven orders of magnitude in in dynamic range, orders of magnitude. So so uh, indeed, from the most frequent to the to the least frequent contacts can be distinguished and sort of and to see everything in the range. And the scope of this data is really striking if you start zooming this data side by side with, with Google Maps. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a, is a, is a high C browser called Highglass developed by Niels Gillenborg's lab in collaboration with us. Uh, and um, uh, Highglass allows you to load not one high C map, but two or several. And here, instead of a high C map, we load it on the right side, a Google map. And so when I zoom twice on the left, it zooms in twice on the, on the right. 
And so you see that there are structures in the high sea data on the left at all scales, at the scale of continents, countries, cities, blocks in the city, even buildings inside MIT. There are, so, so there are structure in high sea data at all scales. And so this is another striking feature of this data. Um, and it also challenged because if, if you want to analyze high sea data properly, you need to analyze at multiple scales at once uh, because each high sea map is roughly a, a Google map at a few meter resolution. And a good experiment would give you a few of such maps and a few mutants so you can easily end up analyzing dozens of Google Earths at a few, few meter resolutions and trying to find differences between them. Um, so, so what are the main, what are the most prominent features? So again, two features for, for the talk today uh, are visible at, at different scales. One is being compartments. So compartments are visible as this checkerboard pattern. I hope you can see my mouse. I can also make it look like a spotlight. Um, so, so these are these checkerboards away from the diagonal. They're also visible between different chromosomes. And what they're telling you is that different regions of the genome have different affinities for each other. So one way to understand, to understand this, the checkerboards is to say that there are some regions, for example, this one, that prefers to interact with that, then prefers to interact with this one, avoids that, this, this region of the genome, again, then interact with another one and so on. Um, and and the, the alternating regions have alternating preferences. And I'll talk more about this. Um, Again, it's also visible in microscopy and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how. Um, one, again, so, so this is just to depict the idea of compartments that if we say there are blue and red compartments, so blue tend to interact with blue. So, so this blue interacts with that blue and then with another blue and so on. And they tend to avoid red ones. What's also evident in this map is that this decomposition to red and blue uh, regions also correlates with certain features of local histone, of local chromosome organization, local meaning histone marks. Again, histone marks are very different in active and inactive regions in the, of the genome. Um, active regions with lots of genes, lots of transcription. So not all the genome is like this, about half of the genome is like that. And another half does not have genes or may have some genes, but the genes would be silent. Um, and so, so the mark that we are seeing here is a typical mark of, of uh, transcriptional activity. And you see that only red regions or largely red regions contain these marks and the blue regions are depleted in these marks. And basically what, what this tells you together with the high C map is that regions with high transcription tend to interact with other regions of high transcription and regions with, poor, with, with low level of transcription or none interact with other uh, no transcription or silent, silent regions of the genomes. Um, and again, one way to depict this is to say, okay, red ones we're gonna call A and uh, active ones and B are going to be inactive ones. And they're gonna be enhancement or kind of enrichment of contacts between A and A and enrichment of BB contacts and depletion of AB contacts. So these are all ju just observations, no mechanisms. We'll talk about mechanisms later. Um, if you zoom into this map, you start seeing other features um, and um, these other features look very different. So they do not have the alternating checkerboard pattern. Instead, they consist of, of kind of triangle, kind of elements close. So maybe squares, a block diagonal structure uh, of the matrix uh, with uh, plus in addition to the squares, there are some dots and flames. And it's really hard to describe what this is kind of, there is, it was the rich structure of things, closed diagonal. And so we'll, we'll talk about this. And so we'll argue kind of traditionally, this, this the squares are called domains, so topologically associated domains. Um, and uh, there are also dots and stripes. And so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them. So what you should realize is that these two, two types of patterns coexist uh, and they mechanistically come from different processes and may have, may, may have played different functional roles. Uh, they might be very different between different cell types. I really browsed more or less randomly some of the data sets that we have. You can just go, if you wanna browse high C data, you can go to highglass.io. You can go to our uh, lab website for all the major papers. We put high C maps such that people can just browse them as, 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 as Google maps because otherwise there was a huge barrier to download the data, organize, load into a browser. Here, here everything is available, just 
go and, and browse. It's I, I mostly did it egoistically for myself because it's always it's always a pain for me to kind of find the data and this way uh, everything's organized and easy to play with. Um, and what you see, for example, on the left you see a fragment of a high C map from an embryonic stem cell. On the right, from the from the uh, human foreskin fibroblast, and you see that there is a difference. On the right, this checkerboard is stronger. Compartments are stronger. On the left, the checkerboards are weaker. Uh, so compartments are stronger in the fibroblast in this particular region. In the re in the next one, again, these are really random random snapshots. Uh, again, you see compartments being stronger on the, uh, in the fibroblast, but then this near diagonal patterns seem to be stronger in, in ESLs. They're kind of similar, but they're not identical. So you should realize that these patterns are changing as cells, as cells differentiate and progress through their, through their uh, lifetimes. So what are the mechanisms? So we'll, again, just to give you a quick summary of our understanding, and I'll take you through some more specific uh, stories in, 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 in a few slides. Mm, we believe that compartments represent a compartmentalization of the genome, this formation of checkerboards, uh, represents a phenomenon known from microscopy when inactive regions are largely the periphery and active ones are largely at the center of the nucleus. And, and they're, they're Phase separation, in fact, corresponds to what's called uh, microphase separation, um, and uh, the, the, the the actual separation of, of red and uh, green is driven by attraction of the silenced regions to each other, um, and and their peripheral positioning is is mediated by attraction of this red regions to the nuclear lamina, so so kind of a shell at the uh, at the periphery of the nucleus. So uh, as far as the structures close to diagonal, we believe that they're formed by the process of uh, that's called loop extrusion. It's an ATP driven, motor driven process where motor is essentially a very special type that we first predicted theoretically. And then, and then experiments have shown that indeed these motors do exist and do what, what we believe they're doing. So that these motors form progressive larger loops and there are specific stop signs in the genome that lead to formation of this patterns that I showed you. And so this is this is just to give you a quick summary of what's gonna happen next. Uh, so let's discuss loop extrusion first. Uh, before maybe I should stop for quick questions about high C in general. Uh, so if there are any questions, it's a good moment to ask them now. Before going to the next slide. Any questions, I will try to... Uh, I, suggest my... we, I suggest that we keep going because there's a 45 minute session with questions. Okay, okay, okay. But if there are any burning questions, I will be stopping for burning questions. Otherwise, I feel that I'm talking to, to my screen. Okay, are there any urgent questions? <laughs> there are no urgent questions, only very okay. challenging ones. Okay, okay, good. Uh, okay, then, then let's delay questions for the, for the uh, Q&A session. So, so as far as loop extrusion, um, what we did in 2015, we decided to ask a question uh, of what kind of mechanisms can lead to formation of this global uh, structures close to diagonal, this topologically associated domains or TADs. And uh, my group was a computational group. Uh, beyond processing high C data, we do polymer simulations. So we set up a system for the polymer simulations where a large uh, polymer was subject to uh, activity of simulated loop extruders. This yellow, a pair of this yellow balls is, is a single loop extruder that progressively moves on the, on the chain and forms a large and larger loop here shown in red, here, yeah. Um, and um, this, uh, uh, and we have multiple side loop extruders acting on the chain at once. And in parallel to them, there are stop signs. They're not shown on the polymer, but there are stop signs on the chain. And the stop signs block progression of loop extrusion machinery. Um, there was a question in the chat. No, there was no question in the chat. Okay. Um, and and um, you know, this uh, red symbols depict proteins of CTCF that can, that can block loop extrusion. So what we found in the simulations is that if you do the simulations and then, and then measure pairwise quantum frequency the way high C experiment does this, 
then we'll see that the uh, pattern of contacts very much captures features that we've seen in high seed data. Uh, in particular, you see the dots, you see like in high C data, you see the stripes, you see nested domains, uh, you see many, many features that are, that are very reminiscent of the high resolution high C data. And again, I need to mention that this is that this work was was led by by Max Imakai, who is now at Biobot and MIT, and Jeff Fudenberg, who is now a professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, and so, what what Max, uh, Jeff, uh, and and others have shown is that sort of this kind of process of loop exclusion can reproduce many of the features we are seeing in in uh, high C maps close to diagonal. So, so that immediately made several predictions. One being that if you get rid of the loop extruding protein, then you should see these domains vanishing. And um, we were lucky to collaborate with, with Francois Spitz, who was a PI at uh, Institute Pasteur in Paris, uh, and uh, his postdoc, Wittke Schwarzer. And they've done a really amazing experiment where they got rid of a protein that at that time was believed to, to load cohesion on DNA. Now we really understand it's just a part of the cohesion machinery. It's very hard to get rid of cohesion. Our predicted loop extruder, I will talk more about different predicted loop extruders, cohesion being one of them, um, uh, because it's essential for cell division. So you get rid of it, cells cannot progress through cell division, so they die. So it needs to be done in post mitotic cells, and that's what it was done. It was done in, in the mouse liver. Uh, of, of, of small mice, and high C was done before and after that, and the analysis of this data was done by Nizar Abdinur, who is now starting his group at UMass Medical Center in Wusta, and Anton Globroitko, who is a PI at IMBA Vienna. So this is a high C map before you get rid of loop extrusion, and that's how it looks after, before and after. And if I were teaching you in person, I would ask you to tell me what had happened. But because, because it's, a, it's a bit of a one-way channel at this moment, um, I can tell you what happened is you see that all these near diagonal features, sorry, all these near diagonal features that we beautifully reproduced in simulations, they, they disappeared. But notice that compartments, all these large scale checkerboards, they remain not only unperturbed, but they may have gotten even stronger. So that argues for two things. First, that loop extrusion is essential for formation of these features next to diagonal. And uh, secondly, that compartmentalization or this global, uh, as we argue, phase separation in the genome is mediated by a completely different process that is not affected or maybe even benefited by removal of the loop extruding process. Uh, another evidence of loop extrusion came from uh, uh, single molecule experiments. Um, in fact, uh, the first single molecule experiment of this type was done by Case Decker, uh, uh, no relationship to Job Decker, just the common Dutch name, um, who demonstrated that uh, the loop of the proteins of uh, condensin, also kind of close relative of cohesion that we predict tau loop extruders are indeed loop extruders. They can extrude loops in vitro. And that, what I'm showing you is the paper that came out uh, right before COVID. So this is a work from, from Jan Michael Peters lab. Uh, what was done in this experiment, DNA was attached to a glass slide, uh, was stretched. So there's a multiple molecules of DNA, each, uh, each being stretched in the flow of, of buffer. So, so this one molecule of DNA. Uh, and, then as, uh, and then they added cohesin uh, to the uh, cohesin and ATP. And you see that this that these DNA molecules will, will turn into some else. They will turn into these extended structures. Uh, let me highlight them here on another molecule. And instead, instead of these arches, you start seeing this kind of things, y letter shaped uh, elements. And in fact, these are loops. I will play this without without annotation now. Uh, and you'll see that indeed sort of uh, you see how these loops are being formed on multiple DNA on multiple individual DNA molecules. So that was a very clear in vitro demonstration that loop exclusion process is not only a fantasy that exists in our simulations, but in fact the process that is happening inside, in this case, in, in vitro. 
And then in vivo, we can only see indirect evidence of that, but we start seeing more, and I'll tell you about this in a second. So at that point uh, in the field, so this is roughly before COVID, as I told you, uh, we have good understanding that there are proteins of the SMC class. These are huge proteins that we predicted extrude loops. And in fact, it looks like they do. Um, uh, and again, what's important again for, for formation of these domains is that they can also, that they're also stopped by CTCF molecules. And so this is something that I'll be talking about more is that uh, the proteins of CTCF can stop loop extrusion um, and uh, can stop one part of this motor and the other side, and this is still a prediction, and the other kind of when, when the motor is stopped, the other side of the motor keeps extruding, keeps extruding the loop. So, so for example, when it's blocked here, the other side of the molecule can keep extruding the, the loop uh, until the other CTCF be, is being met. And then the loop stays for some short period of time. Um, so the question is, is this the whole picture? Or is it more complicated in, in vivo? So I'll give you some update on recent works on our recent collaborations that uh, we believe shed light to other processes. So the first interesting uh, discovery came in this collaboration with Kikuri Tichibana, uh, who is now in Munich. And uh, what, we, what we demonstrated is that not only CTCF can stop cohesion, but presumably other proteins can do this. Not every protein, arguably, but certainly replicative helicases. So replicative MCM helicases are is an interesting class of proteins that are important for replication. Um, they're essentially barrels uh, uh, wrapping around uh, DNA. And what, was, what, what we demonstrate in this uh, work with, with Kikui is that if you get rid of MCMs, and that's what, what her lab did. So they got rid of MCMs. And usually when you get rid, some, get rid of something, you either see no effect or you see weakening of things. The surprise was that they got rid of, oops, they got rid of MCM proteins uh, and they saw strengthening of loops. So, so these are the dots on, on high C map. And again, this is in the maternal uh, pronucleus. I will share, kind of, I will uh, skip the details, I'll spare you the details. Uh, this is in the pater uh, paternal uh, 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 zygote. You get rid, so this is the wild type, the dots are somewhat stronger. You get rid of MCM, this dots become much stronger. Um, and um, the question is why? How, how come certain features become so much stronger? Um, after many, many controls, we realize that this is the direct effect of MCM itself. That's not mediated by, by other uh, players. And what we demonstrate by simulations is that you, you could reproduce this uh, under certain conditions. For example, if MCMs were transient randomly positioned boundaries that are, that are relatively permeable to cohesion, so cohesion can go through, uh, but in some cases it would stop for a short period of time. And by stopping, it would create gaps between two neighboring CTCFs, and these gaps would, pro would weaken formation of these loops in the wild type. Once you get rid of MCMs, you would, move, you would observe loops between two neighboring CTCFs more frequently, and that would strengthen these dots, exactly as seen in, in the experiment. <coughs> so this paper just came out uh, in Nature about a month ago, so you can read about more details. But the important echo message is that it's possible that certain other proteins can modulate this process. So what else can modulate loop extrusion? Um, this is our uh, recent by archive. So it's, it's a paper uh, uh, and the project led by Ed Bennigan, a very talented postdoc in my book, who will in fact be on the, on the faculty job market uh, this year. So what Ed, um, again, a physicist uh, by training has shown is that uh, another process can stop loop extrusion. And this process being transcription itself. Um, it, did, it didn't surprise us entirely because we've had a similar phenomenon in uh, bacteria. Uh, but here we're seeing this in eukaryotes. It's a collaboration with the young Michael Peters lab. Um, and uh, what, what we noticed is that uh, if CTCF is removed, there is a very particular pattern of contacts that you, you may be able to observe around a gene. You cannot see it around every gene, 
But if you average IC map over multiple genes, you see kind of an average contact pattern of a gene. So it's a single gene high C map, if you wish. Um, and the single gene high C map shows, shows this very peculiar pattern of interactions. Um, and we said, what kind of process can reproduce this? And again, we went to modeling and tried to see what kind of mechanistic process can lead to this. And again, learning from our experience in bacteria, we suggested that uh, polymerase can interact with cohesin in two, in, in two interesting ways. First of all, you should realize that polymerase is a relatively slow motor and cohesin is a very fast motor. Cohesin can move, according to in vitro experiments, at the speed of about 1 kb per second. <coughs> uh, polymerase moves about 10 times slower. So that means that if cohesin extrudes 10 kb per second and starts upstream of the gene, it will need the polymerase. It will catch up with the polymerase that is slowly moving and transcribing. And then it will be trailing with the polymerase. So we go do co-directional collision. So cohesin would be going behind the polymerase while at the same time extruding loops. So, so the other end of it, if you wish, would be somewhere remote on, on, the, on the genome. Uh, however, if cohesin is being met by the polymerase, uh, what's important is that cohesin has a relatively low stall force. So it stops at about one piconewton, or maybe even less than a piconewton of force. Polymerase, again, being a slow, but a very powerful motor, can push obstacles and has a much higher stall force. So it would, in this case, be pushing cohesion back. Um, sorry, that was the, the previous one was the head-on collision. And now that we're in this situation when, no, 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 sorry. Uh, that was right. And so, so now we're in the head-on collision. So polymerase pushes cohesin here. Um, and what we demonstrated is that, uh, again, in the particular parameter range, you can see the phenomenon of uh, cohesion, of, of formation of the pattern that is not exactly what we're seeing in the experiment, but very closely resembles many features of the experimental map. We see this upstream flames. We see accumulation of cohesion at the, at the transcription start site. Uh, we see kind of insulation of the upstream from the downstream regions and, and so on. So we see many features that are very much reminiscent of what we're seeing in the experiment, arguing that it's very possible that polymerases themselves are pushing cohesion and stopping cohesion. Uh, nevertheless, they need to be permeable. Otherwise, we would see a very different pattern here. So, so cohesion has a mechanism of, of bypassing the polymerase. Um, this theory also made an interesting prediction that cohesin is not loaded at the promoter. There were, there were all the papers that argued that cohesin is loaded at the promoter. But the theory made the prediction. In fact, you're gonna get this pattern not because cohesin is loaded at the promoter, but, but because it's stopped at the promoter. Um, and in fact, this prediction was tested by Jan Michael Peter's lab. And I encourage you to read this, this uh, by archive because it basically shows that all the observation of cohesin loaded at promoter is a result of a bad antibody used in chip seek experiment. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so that I kind of gave you an overview of what else could stop loop extrusion. But another question is like, how transient are these loops? What's the lifetime of a loop? Um, extruded loops are constantly changing because they're constantly growing. But other are stable loops. So high C data kind of, you see these dots in high C data that would argue that maybe there are stable loops. In fact, we analyzed the structures in our 2016 uh, paper where we proposed a loop extrusion as a mechanism of chromosome uh, folding in the interface. And we argued that in fact, these loops are very transient. We say they, they, the dots and, and uh, tads are not static structures. They emerge as a result of continuous dynamics of loop extrusion. Um, and in fact, the other prediction that the theory made is that about half of the genome is in the loops and another half of the genome at any moment in time is not in the loops. So again, <coughs> uh, we also predicted that again, it's a motor driven process. Uh, I, are, I demonstrated, uh, I kind of, I showed you experiments which supported this, but how about observing this dynamics in vivo? Here we were lucky to have a fantastic colleague here at MIT, Anders Hansen uh, at the bioengineering department uh, who, uh, has, who, with whom we collaborated on, on this uh, beautiful project. Again, uh, Anders's group doing the experiments and, and my group uh, analyzing this data and developing the computational models uh, to, to rationalize what's happening. 
he actually was modeling didn't play a crucial role what played the crucial role was the ability to actually uh, analyze data in a very different way than it's traditionally done so this a live cell microscopy data two ctcf sites are labeled with fluorescent labels uh, and then there is and then uh, these two labels are constantly monitored in a live cell and from this uh, data what we were able to do is to infer the state when the two la labels uh, are in the when the structure is what we call in the loop state it's not it doesn't mean that the two things are really next to each other that's not enough. it means that they move together um, in a correlated fashion and so from from the analysis of trajectories again a, a fantastic physics student simon gross holtz uh, inferred this looped state um, and what we found is was very surprising we found that the looped state in the wild type uh, is present only in about six percent of the cells so six percent of the time the two ctcfs are actually looped despite of having this very pronounced bit in the high c map behind on the screen um, we also found that the loop, that the lifetime of the loop is not that strong, is not that that extended. So typical lifetime is somewhere between twenty to thirty minutes. So so these loops are relatively short lived, and and they're not present most of the time. Which argue that it, what what's important is not the final loop state, but the constant process of extrusion. Um, and again, the experiments also confirmed our prediction that about uh, 50 to 70 percent of the genome is in the loops. And again, as I told you, that most of the time, any region of the genome is partially excluded. Uh, fully looped or no loops uh, are rare. Uh, that also brings a very important point that I want to kind of um, highlight for for the kind of as a part of I would say teaching. In many cases, <coughs> people misunderstand loop extrusion. Misunderstand saying, okay, what's about, what's about loop extrusion? These are just loops. And we know about existence of chromatin loops for decades. Uh, if you have loops, that's gonna work by itself. And that's not right. Um, there are many drawings like this and they argue, okay, if you have two neighboring loops, these loops would be insulated from each other. They're not. Uh, to get insulation that we see in IC maps, you really need constant perpetual process of extrusion. Stable loops would give you a map that you're seeing on the left. You would see very strong corner peaks and you would see basically no insulation, no density within these domains. So to achieve density within the domains, you need to really uh, have continuous process. So stable loops that you frequently see drawn experiments are not facilitating intra-loop interactions and they are not really insulating. So it's the continuous process and this collaboration with Anders and the paper that came out in science a few weeks ago argues that, that, that it's a continuous process of loop extrusion that we are seeing inside living cells. And the models argue that you need this continuous process to reproduce high C data. Um, so forget about stable loops. Um, now, uh, let me tell you about uh, our ongoing work. It's, it's an ongoing collaboration. Now, it started as a project in the lab, but since then, all the, all the participants have graduated and started their, their uh, careers uh, as independent scientists. But we keep working on this project with Nizar, Jeff, and Max. Um, unbiarchived, meaning unpublished. It's a new unpublished for me, because we put everything in the bioarchive. Um, and so what, what we're trying to, to understand in this process is what, what's the functional role of loop extrusion? And the, and the hypothesis that we have is that the functional role of loop extrusion is to mediate long range interactions, uh, such as in cancer promote interactions that you already heard about and we'll hear more about through this, through this symposium. Um, but if you look at the, at the high C data, you say, well, it looks like loop extrusion even if it creates all the structures in high C data, really doesn't change things by a lot. So if you look at the insulation between contacts within a domain and between two domains, you see at most twofold insulation. It's not an incredibly strong insulation. And you don't see really much of facilitation of contacts by 
by the structures, you see maybe threefold, fourfold facilitation. So it's not very impressive. So we argue that maybe we're not seeing everything in high C, primarily because high C has a particular contact radius. And microscopy is not a remedy either, because in microscopy, again, most of things, when we say things are in contact, would be something closer than 250 nanometers. High C may push it to maybe 150 nanometers. New micro C technology might be able to push it to 50 nanometers, but we're not seeing the whole picture. So the real interactions between molecular complexes should start when complexes really come in contact with each other. Otherwise, they don't know that they're in contact. Uh, and that would require a proximity of about 15 nanometers or maybe maybe even less than that. So we, say, we ask the question like, if I run my simulations and ask about the patterns that would emerge in this kind of virtual my, kind of experiment in this future experiment that we call nano C. Uh, so micros, in micro C, we certainly start seeing facilitation of contacts much more. <coughs> in the simulated nano C, we see an interesting phenomenon we see that insulation doesn't really get much stronger, but we start seeing facilitation of contacts by loop extrusion. And this facilitation can easily go 40 fold and more. And that argues for an interesting phenomenon. So maybe the role of loop extrusion is not to insulate different regions from each other, the way we thought about this isolated domain, but maybe the, the goal of CTCF is to activate long range communication or facilitate long range communication. How may, how, what might be the, the molecular picture of this process? Molecular picture might be that if you have an enhancer and a promoter, let's say that's a promoter and that's an enhancer. That, that would be a promoter, sorry, in green and that would be an enhancer in yellow. And let's say there is a CTCF side close to a promoter. Then if loop extruders land somewhere within the stretch of the genome, they would start forming a progressively larger loop until they stop at the CTCF. And then as they stop on one side, as, I, as we predicted, they would continue extruding DNA on the other side, kind of reeling DNA in. And that would allow this CTCF proximal promoter to scan an extended region of the genome. So by forming a larger loop, what, what cohesion does is facilitates the scanning. And maybe the scanning is more important than the loop itself because the loop is very transient, as we argue, and as was demonstrated now by Anders. Um, so uh, what, what, what this process would generate in simulations are these very prominent stripes. And we see the stripes in many cases close to, close to, to many developmental and regulatory important genes, such as Sony Hedgecock locus or the Mic locus. So the stripes, notice, they, they stretch for megabases. Notice the scale here. Typical single loop is about 100, maybe 200 kilobases. So these lines stretch for easily two, two or three megabases of DNA. So we we'll argue that, that by stabilizing uh, cohesion at CTCF, you can achieve these ex exceedingly long stripes that are essentially traces of the scanning process. And we see many of them in, in high resolution micro C data. Uh, without again going into details, but just giving you a sense for what this, what this argument uh, predicts is that by placing boundaries or by, by placing stop signs such as CTCFs or maybe other stop signs as we argue transcription by itself can be a stop. Um, you can create a communication system where a regulatory information contained in one, next to one stop sign would be transmitted through, 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 uh, through a particular genomic region and the stops would be like receivers. So if you, you can think about this as transmitting from here and receiving this <coughs> regulatory information at other stop signs, not necessarily at CTCF. So, so that's, that's not going to work in the lab. So I just gave you a sense for this, but uh, that if, if true, that would turn uh, a mechanism that was originally proposed for compacting the genome as a mechanism for long range genomic communication. Um, since we're not taking, I don't know, let me stop for burning questions and then I will talk for another 20 minutes about some smells. Burning questions. You can also type them in, in oh, you don't have access to, to chat. Do you have access to chat? 
there is one burning question. Yes, very good. Just, just a question about what you uh, just, oh, sorry, I'm DP uh, at MIT working with the group. Um, so you mentioned this uh, communication mechanism. Does this require for the enhancer or rather the promoter to be positioned near the stop sign, so near a CTCF barrier in order to have this reeling mechanism be the uh, form of communication or can the promoter be positioned anywhere within, um, within the TAD? Uh, in order to see this type of communication. Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the great question, Deepti. In fact, I, I did. I did. I didn't show some of the slides uh, in the interest of time. But yes. So for this mechanism to work, either the promoter or the enhancer uh, needs to needs to be located close to a CTC upside or another boundary or another barrier. As we argue, the class of barriers can be broader than what we understand right now. But we do indeed see that uh, we do see genome-wide colocalization of CTCFs and promoters, uh, and less so of enhancers. So, in other words, one of the elements needs to have a CTCF or another stock, and the other element can be located through the body. And we typically see that enhancers are located through the body of a head. And genes are typically located at the boundary. This, this is known for many years since TEDs were discovered by um, Elfesh Nora and, and uh, Edith Hurd and, and Bing Ren, um, that, that genes tend to be localized at, at boundaries. And now, now, so that might be one of the reasons. But yes, thank you for the great question. OK. Uh, with that, let me let me switch gears and talk about compartmentalization, and we can discuss extrusion during the Q and A. Uh, so, what is compartmentalization? I told you that at the high C level, uh, it manifests itself as uh, this checkerboard pattern on the on the high C map, um, and in microscopy, it's known for decades as the phenomenon of uh, locating active chromatin in the center of the nucleus um, and inactive chromatin at the inactive chromatin at the nucleus. Uh, so the question is, uh, yes, so, so another important feature of um, uh, this, of heterochromatin in general, is that it's highly dense. So in this beautiful work from Claude, Claude Boucher's group, uh, uh, so so what, what was what was measured is the spatial is the volume fraction occupied by different uh, genomic regions, and what they argued is that euchromatin typically has about twenty to thirty percent volume fraction, while heterochromatin mitotic chromosomes are typically have about twofold if uh, twofold if not more higher uh, volume fraction of uh, heterochromatin. So these are two important features. Bear them in mind. Heterochromatin and euchromatin are spatially segregated, and heterochromatin that has a higher volume density. Both of these things will turn out to be important. So first, the first question is, what's the mechanism of compartmentalization? Uh, we looked at this question uh, in our collaboration with Irina Solovey and Job Decker, but uh, before going into this, you can ask generally more physics kind of motivated question, again, similar to, to Arup's presentation, I will start with, with some physics uh, phenomena. So if you have a polymer that consists of A and B blocks, uh, this, this polymer is called the block copolymer. And what these block copolymers are known to do is that if you have different chemical properties of A and B groups, they will, uh, they will form microphases. So it will lead to microphase separation. So what's the difference between microphase and general phase separation? The difference is that in equilibrium, microphase separation uh, is characterized by formation of another phase. So it's a separate, uh, so it's a, some spatial uh, area with different, with different AB compo uh, uh, composition. And this the sizes of these areas depend on the lengths of the stretches of B, for example, blocks. So if B are shorter, that might be like small, small spherical inclusions as, uh, for example, B get longer, 
they will become continuous rods or they can form uh, meshes. And then at some level, uh, it would start forming layers with the thickness of the layer that depends on the, on the lengths of these elements in the polymer. <coughs> so in other words, these phases are not infinite phases. Like if you, if you demix water and oil, you would have half of your bottle filled with oil and another half with, with, with water, and they're not mixing uh, in equilibrium. Uh, here, even in equilibrium, they're gonna be finite size um, phases. Uh, again, and now, now going back to heterochromatin, and again, so this, uh, I'm just saying that this literally textbook picture, this is a picture from, from a famous textbook by Shura Grosberg, again, illustrating the same principle. Um, so uh, the question now at the, at the, at the biophysical level is if you have this block copolymer of A and B, uh, what are the processes that lead to this AB uh, phase separation? Um, and we would like you to collaborate with the group of Verena Solovey um, that has been studying uh, heterochromatin for decades and particularly was interested in this very uh, peculiar biological system. And as, for me, it's also an interesting example when you start looking at something very exotic and you learn some general principles from this. The exotic here being uh, inverted nuclei. So in the conventional nucleus, heterochromatin or B-chromatins at the periphery and U-chromatin are active in the center. In the inverted nuclei of the rods of nocturnal animals, like most, most of the animals are in fact nocturnal, uh, except for the uh, new apes, us in other words, and uh, the old world monkeys. Um, so we and the old world monkeys are not nocturnal. Uh, all other animals are. And uh, in the rods of animals, um, the nucleus is inverted. Rods of the retina. Um, the heterochromatin is at the center and euchromatin active at the periphery. And this nuclei do not have this particular, do not have a way of attaching the chromatin to this particular shell uh, depicted here as the lamina. They do have lamina, but there is no attachment to the lamina. Um, and what Solovey group have, uh, has shown is that this rods, this, this inverted nuclei in the rods become natural, that this nuclei get formed naturally during the development of uh, the animal. Moreover, they designed a system where you can get, where you can start with the conventional architecture and you can get inverted architecture synthetically. So we we'll say, okay, that's a perfect system to understand whether this attraction between B monomers or A monomers uh, and what's the role of the lamina? And it looks like you can get rid of attraction of heterochromatin to the lamina and you still get this uh, separation of green and red. So we did high C in collaboration with the Becker lab on this, on this uh, cells. So these are images of inverted nuclei. Uh, there is also another type of chromatin called C chromatin. And again, uh, that's a very strong heterochromatin uh, that's all, that is in the center of the nucleus. Um, in inverted nuclei, and we ask the question, what kind of models can reproduce both the high C data and the and these images? Notice that this high C data look entirely normal. You see this checkerboard, you, you see all other features. So high C is really not informative of the spatial location of regions. It tells about relative quantum frequencies. <coughs> so we developed a model with three types of monomers. So it's a block copolymer with C being pericentric heterochromatin uh, that is located close to the uh, centromere in the mouse chromosome, and then blocks of many blocks of A and B. Uh, and now we need to decide how strongly they should attract each other um, such that we can reproduce this microscopy and we'll reproduce high C. And we start with the inverted nucleus. Um, and uh, there are, even if you fix the values there are 720 ways how these six interactions uh, can be relative to each other. So we enumerated the 620 classes of models because each ordering gives you a class of models. And then what we saw is that you can get this phase separation. You can get the, this kind of A and B separated from each other, but you can also get all sorts of weird things. So these are, this are 720 different models. Um, on the x-axis is just the model number. On the y-axis is the similarity measured between this model and the microscopy image. 
in terms of relative this radial positions of red, green, and blue. Um, and the first eight models from zero to seven for Python speakers um, um, look reasonable. And then you see all sorts of like Mickey Mouse and mushrooms and like all sorts of weird things just here, just to illustrate that in fact, other models don't do this. But the first eight ones reproduce this, this organization. And what's common about them is that they have the strongest CC attraction, very strong BB attraction. And their attraction between active regions is very weak and in fact dispensable. If you just set AA to zero and it will, it will work beautifully. So in other words, the conclusion is that heterochromatin needs to attract other heterochromatin very, very strongly to reproduce what we see in inverted nuclei. And if we, were going to, if we want to go into the conventional ones, we need to do again, similar microscopy and high C. And in the simulations, it turned out that what you need to add, you need to add attraction of B to the lamina, and you need to add attraction of C to the lamina, and that would, that would de-invert the inverted nucleus back into the normal one. Uh, but even in the inverted one, you see, you perfectly see this microphase separation. So the take home message is that AA attraction between active regions is dispensable for microphase separation of the type I'm talking about, this very large scale phenomenon um, that, that what's, what drives this is the attraction between heterochromatic regions and then heterochromatic, heterochromatin be tethered to the lamina provides you the positioning of this. But without it, it's also a perfectly functional nucleus. So uh, that kind of gives you the overall picture of, of how these things are organized um, mechanistically. Uh, it still doesn't really tell you what are the forces. We very much hope to measure these forces in our um, new collaboration, ongoing collaboration with, again. So, so this study was published a couple of years ago. So it's in nature. Uh, uh, it's a nature proper with, the, with Martin Falk who led this group. Uh, and there is, there is a paper that's coming out in a couple of weeks in science. It's our collaboration with Antoine Poulon at Institut Puy. One of the reasons why I'm here in France is this collaboration. Uh, it's a really exciting project that gives us a hope to actually measure forces inside living cells. And the idea of the method that Antoine has developed is that one can attach a magnetic particle to a locus of the chromosome and then apply a magnetic field and see pull at this locus and see how it relocalizes, then release and see how it goes back. And by constantly pulling and releasing, pulling and releasing, we start measuring uh, forces and interactions inside living cells. Um, and we started seeing that heterochromatin might be sticky. We haven't, in this project, we haven't really explored heterochromatin specifically, but we already have a technology that's working and should allow us to measure how strongly, uh, <coughs> how strongly heterochromatin can stick to other heterochromatic regions and all the same to heterochromatin as well. So we can probe lots of the mechanisms that we're talking about in the, exploring in the models and mechanisms about which we know from microscopy and imaging out by the actual perturbative experiment. I'm, I'm really happy to be, to be part of, of this fantastic team that Antoine brought together. Um, so, okay, I told you about, uh, I have 10 minutes before we start clapping. Um, and uh, in the last five, five minutes. Five minutes, you have five minutes. Five minutes, I have five minutes. Okay, I have five minutes before I start clapping. So in the five minutes, I'll tell you about our ongoing work where we're trying to understand what's the role of the spatial segregation. And the hypothesis is that it helps to maintain the epigenetic memory. And this is the work of Jeremy Owen and Dina Smanovich. Uh, and with this, I will skip slightly to uh, this slide. Um, and what is epigenetic memory? Epigenetic memory is a particular pattern of histone, of histone marks, chemical modifications. And the question is how do cells maintain these modifications? Uh, the challenge is that on every cell division, this modification needs to be diluted because they go to two daughter cells. Uh, and then there is a mechanism, according to a textbook, that there is an enzyme that reads a mark and can make this mark spread to a nearby histone. Um, and what we ask is, does the tree really, does this, if, if you have such a reader-writer mechanism on top of constant dilution of the histone um, marks, 
would this really lead to a stable memory? So we decided to probe this by simulations. So what we've done, we set up simulations where marks can spread not only in 1D, but marks can also spread in 3D to nearby pistons. Uh, and in the simulations, we impose the marks as we argued marked regions or heterochrom heterochromatic regions should attract each other. So they would fold. Then we would let, after folding, there is there going to be an interface. During interface, the marks will be spreading and uh, changing their pattern. And then after that, there's going to be another metaphase during which the chromosome would uh, keep their marks, but would refold and continue doing this. Uh, and, we'll, and we ask, so when the spreading of the marks, in addition to this formation of the dense condensates of heterochromatin, would be able to maintain heterochromatic, would, would be able to maintain the, the original pattern that I impose at the, at the start of this process, this pattern. Uh, and what we found, so let me quickly tell you what we found, is that incredibly difficult to maintain this memory. In most of the cases, what you see is that either you see complete loss of the marks or the marks are spreading everywhere. Here you see time and cell generations and the pattern of the marks on the x-axis. So it doesn't really work. Uh, and what we've also found is that you can make let me switch to the right slide. You can make it work. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is that it, do, it really doesn't work for most of the values of the spreading rate and the loss rate, irrespective of the value of alpha. Alpha being the strength of attraction between heterochromatic regions. Um, so it's not gonna work unless we introduce an additional quantity which is the limited enzyme. If we limit the amount of the enzyme that can spread the mark, then you see a very stable pattern of marks. And what's essential for this are three, three features. You need compartmentalization, or in other words, formation of the condensates of heterochromatin, uh, such that there is a higher volume fraction of heterochromatin there. You need the 3D spreading of the marks and you need the limited enzyme. And then you can maintain even very complex patterns of marks. For example, here I marked a few islands and 200 cell generations later, you still see that roughly these islands are maintained. Um, and uh, with this, I will just summarize what I told you. Uh, that is that you need dense condensates of decompartment. You need three spreading, limited enzyme, and that may turn chromosome into a beautiful memory machine that helps to main, that helps maintain the sequence of marks. Uh, and in general, I argue that you have genomic communication in the form of loop extrusion and um, compartmentalization in turn can help maintain the, the marks. With this, I will acknowledge fantastic uh, students that I was privileged to work with uh, through many of these projects. Many of them have already moved uh, to continue their future careers. And I'm very grateful to collaborate with Job Decker, Anders Hansen, Kiko Itachibana, Michael, Jan Michael Peters, Irina Solvay, and many others. And finally, my thanks for the funding to NSF, NIH, uh, HFSP, and the Blaise Pascal um, uh, Fellowship that I want to be here in France. And thank you for attention. Okay, so we are gonna get started now. So we are going to get started now. So please take your seat again. So the idea is now just as in the first session, we will have free flowing discussion. And um, again, I encourage the students to be vocal and uh, ask as many questions as you possibly can, um, because, you know, you, 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 there is no problem if your question is even not, you know, it doesn't matter what the question is, because as Wolfgang Pauli said, you know, 
there's certain intellectual merit to being wrong, none for being silent. So uh, you should ask question. So Leonid, let me <laughs> take uh, prerogative and ask the first question. I did not understand the mechanism of your memory model. Can you explain mm -hmm. what worked and what didn't work? Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, it was it was last few minutes. So let me, let me share it again. Don't give a whole talk about it, but. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, don't worry. I'll give you, I'll give you one slide about it. The overall setup is the following. So, so the, 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 what's important is to understand the setup first. Can you see, can you see my screen? Hello? Uh, I, I can't quite hear from your side. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, 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 yes. So the setup is that there are two types of monomers, A and B. B can spread. So as in other words, in a reaction, A plus B gives you BB is, is what's happening on this polymer. And, and as this happens, polymer periodically refolds. So, so there was a spreading of the mark and then marks are frozen and the polymer is allowed to refold. Uh, the marks can spread by spatial spreadings, meaning that the enzyme recognizes B and recognizes a marked region, or in other words, B, and imposes a mark into an A monomer, turning it essentially into B. Um, so this by itself does not work uh, because this, okay, let me again, just show you one slide. Oh my God, I don't know what this is. Um, this by itself does not wo work uh, because what's happening is that depending on the spreading rate over the loss rate and the, and the strengths of attraction that forms the condensate, you either end up with everything marked. Again, this is time in each of the squares. It's a, it's a phase diagram of, of, of dynamics. So, so it either spreads everywhere or it's nowhere. There might be some region of, co of kind of coexistence, but it's relatively narrow. And even there, there is a gradual spreading. Uh, this by itself does not work. It's you alpha. need to step. What is this alpha? Alpha. alpha is the strengths of alpha is the strengths of attraction. Sorry, alpha is the strengths of attraction between uh, B and B regions. Strengths of attraction. Okay. Uh, so irrespective of alpha and irrespective of S and L, S is the spreading rate, this, the rate of this reaction. And the L is the loss rate, the, the rate of this reaction. Irrespective of alpha uh, and, um, and S over L, there is no stability in the system. It's, it's in one of the two regimes where it's either everything is marked or nothing is marked. There is there is another interesting regime where everything is sparsely marked, but it's not interesting because you cannot preserve a memory. You cannot impose a pattern and the pattern stays. So to preserve a pattern, what you need is one more feature. Remember here you have phase separation, three spatial spreading of the marks, but it's not stable. So you need to add one more feature. This feature being, that the, the, you need an explicit enzyme that, that, that facilitates the spreading of the mark. If there is an enzyme, then there is a Michaelis-Menten reaction, and then this reaction cannot proceed faster than the maximal rate of the Michaelis-Menten reaction, Vmax, right? KK times the enzyme concentration. If you have limited enzyme, then everything immediately stabilizes. Then you see, you start with a particular region mark, it wiggles, it doesn't live forever. We don't live forever either. Um, but for a few hundred cell divisions, the pattern is preserved. And then you can have a regime now in this phase diagram where for sufficiently strong alphas, you need sufficiently strong alphas, uh, you start with a particular pattern and this pattern persists. Does it help? 
Sorry, I can't hear you again on the other, from the other Yes, side. I, I, that's because I didn't turn the mic. Yeah. Yes, I understand it now. Thank you very much. I understand yeah. it. Okay, good. It basically, the, the, the limited enzyme adds stability to a to the to the uh, uh, to the spatial pattern that you see. That's it. exactly. But but to, another thing that I didn't say is that to maintain this pattern, it's important not only to have a condensate, but to have a condensate such that the that the volume fraction in this condensate is higher. You need to ha have a higher yeah, yeah. density, uh, volume fraction density uh, in this condensate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, CTCF RNA binding and the role it might play in stability of TADS. Uh, and also if you disrupt CTCF, you still see TAD formation or, or you can disrupt TAD formation, but you still have enhancer promoter interactions within the TAD. So does that relate to what we heard earlier about uh, promoter enhancer condensates? Uh, okay, so so there are, there are a couple of questions. First, about the role of RNA in mediating uh, CTCF cohesion interaction. Uh, the quick answer is it's, it has been reported, but there is no mechanistic understanding of this. Um, there were a couple of papers uh, perturbing a CT, an RNA binding domain of CTCF but how it leads to changes in high map is not entirely clear. These changes are not nearly uh, comparable, not nearly close to complete loss of CTCF. There are some weird changes when this RNA binding uh, of CTCF is perturbed. Uh, it's a work of Anders Hansen, one of the papers. So he would be a better reference, but there is no understanding how it works. Uh, the second question was what happens if you deplete CTCF? If you deplete CTCF, full depletion also leads to, to the loss of boundaries. Uh, loop extrusion still proce uh, proceeds, but the boundaries are lost. Uh, so in terms of high C, the pattern is, is, is similar, but not identical to that of the loss of, maybe I should illustrate this actually uh, with, with a slide, maybe from another presentation in fact. Um, okay, let me play this slide and share my screen. Uh, so, so this is this is a cartoon, but it kind of gives you an idea. So, if there is no, if there is neither loop extrusion nor CTCF, you see particular, you see no particular pattern of high C. You see just a contact frequency pattern from the polymer itself. If you have loop extrusion and no CTCF, then CTCF general cohesion loop extrusion essentially facilitates long range interactions. Uh, but there is no particular pattern of, of these interactions. And then when you establish CTCF, then, this, then the pattern emerges because you, blo you, you disallow certain positions of cohesion. Uh, the role of loop extrusion in enhancer promote interactions is, a, is an area of very active debate and, re, and research. Uh, most recent by archives from several groups argue that you need cohesion CTCF system to establish long range interactions for between enhancers and promoters separated by hundreds of kilobases, but you do not need this system for interactions between proximal uh, enhancers and and uh, promoters. So there was, for example, a nice bi archive from a Wendy Bickmore's lab. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm Roy Chen from uh, Lehman Lab at Whitehead Institute. Um, so you have shown uh, very strikingly when you remove the cohesion, um, the change on the high seek map. Um, that's, that was very impressive. Um, is there a way that you can also um, disrupt the uh, phase separation mediated compartments 
uh, and say uh, the same way? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. There is one study. Okay, there are two, there are two examples that I know of where um, there is a major difference in compartmentalization. One being a natural example. Uh, this is our other work with Kiko Itachibana, where high C was done separately on maternal and paternal nuclei in a freshly fertilized egg. So after egg fertilization, the two nuclei live separate lives before the first cell division. And it turned out that the paternal genome is full, is compartmentalized and the maternal one is not. Presumably this is due to the lack of the histone marks or patterns of histone marks clearly established. Kind of kind of similar to the, to the memory picture that I spoke about. There is no pattern to, be, to preserve at this stage. And there are no compartments. Um, then, there is, then there is a paper by George Spracklin who, um, but this is, not, this is a natural system without compartmentalization. I don't know any other natural systems uh, in high eukaryotes where there is no compartmentalization. Um, there were attempts to disrupt compartmentalization. In my mind, they all failed, um, except for there was like depletion of HP1 alpha. You still see various, even in Drosophila, you still see, you see some changes, but no loss of compartmentalization. Um, there was one paper by George Spracklin uh, that is coming out in Nature Structural Molecular Biology. This is our collaboration with the Decker Lab, where um, a compartmentalization was perturbed by interfering with, the, with enzymes that establish DNA methylation. Surprisingly enough, this led to the changes in the histone marks, not DNA methylation, but the histone, but methylation of histones. And that led to partial loss of compartmentalization. Certain compartments, certain heterochromatic compartments became euchromatic. So again, not a loss, but a considerable changes kind of across the genome. Um, if, if I can pull it up, it would be nice, but uh, it might take me uh, a second to uh, find it. Uh, yes, um, here it is. Let me let me just highlight it on the screen. Yeah, that's this paper, and. Um, the, but but it's great so far. Nobody was able to massively disrupt compartmentalization across 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 the genome. While it loads, I will take other questions. But I'll show you some examples. Any other questions? Are you going to answer this first or? Well, yeah, which, uh, the compartmentalization, for example, this region here, I, I didn't quite, if there was another question, I didn't hear. So, so for example, this, this was a region with, with compartmentalization, with the pattern of compartmentalization kind of over here, being turned into, into some sort of a mess. And again, molecularly, we don't know what's happening, but that's, that's kind of a local loss of compartmentalization. Okay, so all right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question about so in the in the first half of your talk, you gave us this very non-equilibrium and active stirring picture of how uh, the chromatin was organized, right? And then in the second half, we have this very equilibrium block copolymer picture of what's happening, right, for the compartmentalization. So I was kind of wondering, these effective attractions that you're describing, uh, if you turn on activity, what happens to them? Is there a way to kind of square this circle? Um, or, is the, or are you even maybe proposing that the, these attractions are just a product of activity in the first place? Like what's, how do you think about this? Uh, okay, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> 
usually when a speaker is saying that that's a great question, it means that there's a good answer. Uh, so, so the good answer is that we did look at this. In other words, we asked like, irrespective of the mechanism, that uh, underlies formation of compartments, it's effective attraction, whether it's, whether it's activity mediated or whether it's just an attraction. Like on top of this attraction, I would put loop extrusion, I would put an active process. What's gonna be the net effect? What we've seen in some of the data, let me show you again a slide. Uh, I, need, I need to share my screen again. Um, need to find the right presentation. Um, what, what, what we showed at some point, and I kind of uh, emphasize this, that so here you see a map with loop extrusion and with compartmentalization. Now notice what happens if I get rid of loop extrusion. Compartmentalization got stronger you see a, a more crispy pattern of compartmentalization. And Job Decker will talk more about strengths of compartmentalization in this case. But generally you get, you, that already hints at the possibility that loop extrusion may interfere with compartmentalization. So we tested this by simulations. And I think I have a spare slide to illustrate this. Actually, that's the same. Okay, that's, that might be a better example. I zoom out. It's the same, it's the same experiment. The same paper was, was Francois Spitz. This is Nature 2017. With, with loop extrusion on the left, without loop extrusion on the right, you see a striking emergence of this pattern of compartmentalization. But it was there. The point is that it, it's an innate tendency to compartmentalize, but it was partially erased by the activity of loop extrusion. And we tested this by simulations um, with Johannes Nubler. So that's our PNAS paper, I think 2019, um, Nubler et al. And what we've seen is that indeed the active process can partially raise, um, so partially raise tendency of a block copolymer to, to, to microphase separate. So in other words, here you see this strong pattern. This is a zoom in. And then you add a loop, you add an active process on top, and it erases these features, and particularly erases small features at the scale comparable to the scales of loops. And that's an entirely active process because to test this, what we've done, we just created loops. If you just create loops and freeze loop extrusions in place, you're not going to see this effect. So it's an active stirring of the of what an oil interface with a spoon. Yeah, actually. So it looks like active process can destroy uh, compartmentalization in the system. But thank you for this. Thank you for the question. I, I will add a little bit to this discussion because Leonid is aware of this in, um, in work that's not published and your neighbor can tell you much more about it. Uh, we find that you can also through correlated active processes and no attractions you can see organization in the genome in rather interesting ways. And so undoubtedly on all these equilibrium things, you also have superimposition of these active processes. And in some cases, as Leonid describes, you can cr construct an exact kernel that can invert between the non-equilibrium and equilibrium things. But that is to soon come, but you can talk to your neighbor who has been in doing some of this work. Manju. Anju Hingarani, National Science Foundation. Um, Leonid, uh, it was very exciting to hear you mention MCMs. There's a lot of MCM on DNA. So um, is there more information on whether these proteins are creating or establishing relationships between um, chromatin organization dynamics and DNA replication? Ah, okay, Manju, thank you for the great question. Um, we, okay, so let me go to the slide as such that others in the audience can follow our free biology flavor discussion. Um, so MCMs are indeed uh, essential parts of the replication machinery. And uh, surprisingly enough, they are found on, on DNA way before replication kicks in. Um, uh, I'm just looking, sorry, I'm, I'm talking and looking for a slide, which is always 
uh, a challenge. Ah, here it is. Um, right. So, so MCMs are abundant on DNA. Uh, there are different there are different estimates of the density uh, of MCMs. Uh, what we found is that it looks like they interfere with the loop extrusion machinery. Um, what impact it would have on replication in turn, we don't quite know. So for example, we don't know, kind of obviously if you get rid of MCMs, there's gonna be no replication. Um, but wha what's the role of MCM in mediating chromatin folding and whether there might be some sort of a feedback between chromatin folding and replication through MCMs, we don't know. One hypothesis that we have at this moment and one of the one of the observations in this in this study, so so this paper again, I gave you on the our part of the story. There's also beautiful. There are also beautiful um, uh, single molecule experiments uh, from Carl Dudenstadt and Jan Michael Peter's lab in the same paper, which showed that cohesin can interfere or interact with MCMs in single molecule in, in single molecule experiments. But one, one conjecture, they haven't shown this. One conjecture is that cohesin might be able to push MCMs. Essentially, as it extrudes, it might be able to, to displace MCMs. This has not been shown. This is something that they're trying to, to, to test in single molecule experiments. If this is the case, then it would, in fact, close the, the cycle by demonstrating that cohesins themselves can relocalize ro MCMs and this way create potential sites of the origin of replication. Uh, but, this, uh, but this is largely kind of a hypothesis at this point. But, but sort of we're looking at this kind of closing the loop between replication and, and chromosome organization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your, for your question. Yeah, by the way, I might comment on the journal publication stories today in the current world, I noticed that the paper was received and then accepted two years apart, which is more a statement on the editors than anybody else, I think. But anyway, uh, it was it, it, it was it, that, that's true. It was it was a very long journey uh, with lots of new experiments being done. Okay, so people. Yeah, I really like the talk. Um, I want to ask uh, two questions that are somewhat different, but are correlated. One is, uh, first of all, I guess I understand now that autocatalysis is really in at MIT, that you have kind of a mechanism similar to the mechanism of a roop. Uh, I also wondered what the relationship of your of this autocatalytic growth was to the model Bin Zhang has for epigenetic uh, uh, modifications of histones. I don't know the details. And, and the second question correlated with that is it seems like in all these arguments, the underlying DNA is treated as if it was homogeneous uh, the, in your simulations. But of course, if, if we think that there's things that determine DNA structure, DNA nucleosome interactions and so on, those aren't necessarily homogeneous. And that gives you another sort of length scale and so on that can compete with the generated link scale you get from the autocatalysis. So how do you envision that in your, in your thinking? I mean, epigenetic does mean something had to happen in the past that changed the DNA, blah, blah, blah. Uh, not, just, not just the marking, but the original uh, choice uh, of, of where to mark. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so as far as relationship to Bing Jang's uh, models, he essentially has models where um, different his different patterns of histone marks have different affinities. So we largely operate with simpler patterns of histone marks. I spoke about A and B compartments, um, then added a C compartment. Uh, he has, as far as I remember, 16 different types, um, which is good and bad because it might be good if you want to uh, reproduce all the fine features of the map. Uh, it might be excessive because you 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 might be over parameterizing the model uh, because you need 16 squared over two different pairwise interactions. Uh, we had fun with three types uh, and enumerate no possible uh, patterns of interaction. Um, 
but he does not have active process acting on the, on the chromatin, uh, at least until recent papers, maybe. Um, so uh, the same question is about epigenetic marking itself. He has an autocatalytic scheme published in Fizz Rev Letters, not, not the overall structure of the paper on that. I don't know if he's here. But... Oh. We'll, we'll I, can, I can hear you. I, I don't know. I, we'll let, I can hear you. I don't know that story. But let uh, Leonid finish and then, then you speak. Okay. So, sorry. It's, it's a bit difficult to, to hear of, from your side. Um, right. The autocatalytic, I, I don't know the work on the autocatalytic. Uh, 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 processes, but essentially the spreading of the marks can be thought of an autocatalytic process in a sense of uh, marks come close, kind of marked regions come close, and then the mark spreads to their neighbors and it spreads, and that creates a highly unstable uh, pattern of marks. Um, and the question is how to stabilize it, because it's easy to create some sort of positive feedback, it's very difficult to keep it under control. Uh, you don't want to have a nuclear reactor uh, of, of histone marks. Uh, your other question was about DNA itself. Yes, we largely assume that, that inhomogeneity in DNA comes in the form of different transcription factors bound at different places. For example, we have promoters uh, and genes, and so active process of transcription operate there, so it's inhomogeneity in a sense. Uh, and then... Um, uh, at the same time, we have processes. Uh, we have CTCF that mark specific, re that not mark, that establish boundaries. DNA, DNA mechanics itself is not something that we take into account because we usually operate, as you point out, at much larger scales. We kind of one monomer would be easily 30 kilobases of DNA. Um, however, we have one interesting story that I didn't plan to, to talk about but I'll just mention this without showing any slides. Uh, it's a collaboration with Irina Solovey in Munich uh, on a different system. Um, and what, what she observed is that if you have a, an actively transcribed gene, that the act of transcription by itself creates a huge loop that spans across the whole nucleus, microns in length. And uh, the model to explain this was to have essentially change the local properties of chromatin due to the presence of polymerases. So if this chromatin becomes stiffer, for example, by virtue of uh, side chains of RNA repelling from each other. So essentially a bottle brush of RNA. Then this bottle brush of RNA would create a locally stiffer stretch of chromatin and it would by itself form, form this uh, giant uh, arch, if you wish. So we do not model property, local properties of DNA in a sequence dependent manner, but we instead look at uh, kind of large scale local properties that might be driven by active processes. Bill, do you want to comment on the exchange that uh, Peter had? Sure. Well, I guess, uh, I mean, let me just clarify. I guess I think uh, Mernie, well, or Leonid, Leon, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the spreading of the histomark more like in the 3D context to explicitly incorporate the, the, the structures. Um, I guess uh, one difference, I guess, from Leonid model, I think maybe from ours or uh, maybe other people's model was that uh, uh, if you account for the cooperativity uh, among the enzyme that actually actually remove the marks, you also create a kind of steady state for those uh, kind of unmarked chromatin regions. So, so I think in, in that sense, then you would not really sort of lead to a, a spread of maybe of the entire chromosome. You sort of, you, you would also sort of, uh, have a stability of, of the, uh, uh, the unmarked chromatins. I, I don't know whether you have the, the, the unmarked chromatin as a steady state in the, in the model that you have. Uh, if, I, if I understood the question right, so you're asking, so, so we do have an unmarked one. So that's the basal, that's the, that's the yellow one, if you wish. We consider only heterochromatic marks that attract each other. Uh, but it's an interpretation that they have for chromatic. So we have unmarked and marked. Unmarked do not attract each other, marked attract each other. You obviously can add many more layers on top of that, but on top of that, there is a chemical reaction of the unmarked and marked turning into two marked. 
so so that's the that's the act, that's what makes this an active block of polymer system because there is a chemical reaction on top. Uh, is that and then unmarked uh, just neutral? They they just repel as anything else. Repel each other. Was that the question? So I guess uh, well that then. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, because then you you essentially in, incorporate the corrosivity for your marked region. You, you, you can sort of jump through, through, through the loops. But if you don't have a corrosivity for R marks sort of reaction, then you, you naturally basically, well, then you only have, you only have one steady state kind of tilted toward the marked and, and not really uh, for the R marked regions. Uh, no, there are two stable steady states in the system. Uh, one fully, mar fully marked on the right, another fully unmarked on the left. Both are stable. His, his model, if you really think about it, maybe he will object to what I say, but his model is basically the analog of people with brown eyes and blue eyes. And once you get to all blue eyes or all brown eyes, it's like an absorbing boundary condition. And that he has some more, he has other features to this, but that is what is happening. He's getting a stochastically created, I think, stochastically created by stability. I don't know if you agree with Leonard, but I think that's roughly what you're seeing. And yeah, that's why there are two absorbing states, right? Exactly. And it's very hard to maintain and the if, mixture. If you, if you create any model, long time ago, <laughs> Maran Kardar and I showed this, that you can get stochastic biostabilities in a system with no deterministic biostabilities if you introduce an absorbing boundary condition and you introduce irreversibility. He has both these features. That's the general class of this model. But your model, how does it differ from this? You, if you have a two minute comment and Leonard gets no rebuttal, would you like to, would you like to comment, Bin? Your model has other features that limit this to short length scales, the, the, the pattern, right? Well, uh, I guess well, it was not really my model. I think it was not the, maybe the one. It was proposed by, by Don and people. It was like, well, basically what they have is it more like a symmetric model where you have a, a cooperativity for uh, you know both type of reaction. You, you have the methylation reaction, you have the methylation reaction. They sort of, uh, they are all sort of cooperative, which can be sort of naturally a, a bi-stable region. Okay, so we, we would like, let's move on to other topics because Bin and Leonid can discuss this separately in Kendall Square at later time, so. Other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, questions from students. No, Dave, you go. You previously, you prohibited me from no, asking. No, you are a forever student, like um, everybody else. <laughs> I, I, I want to understand what do you mean by continuing the same conversation as these two? You know, the claim, as I understood, was that it is impossible to devise a model those people that you listed did combination of 1D, 3D spreading, no matter what you do for the SOL ratio and alpha that will produce a stable finite domain. Is that the statement you made? Uh, okay, good, 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 good to hear you. Um, it's uh, the statement is, okay, let me, let me share the screen and sort of make it formal. Um, this statement is that in the case of 1D spreading, yep. uh, there is no stability. Uh, because this is this essentially a directed percolation problem. It, it, you, below a certain critical S over L, it shrinks, and above it expands everywhere. Well, Crat now, Crat I may interject, Crabtree's model is essentially 1D. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. This I, this are, these are all 1D models. So, so what I'm showing on the screen is, is a 1D model. Yeah. Now in the 3D model, you get the following picture. If you have a 3D model, irrespective of, of the values of alpha and S of L, you cannot maintain stable memory. You can maintain memory for a few cell divisions if you fine tune the system. So for example, over here, you would see a regime where if you are lucky, you can you can maintain it for maybe five cell divisions. In the one above, it may it may be even longer, but it requires fine tuning. In other words, putting a pencil on its tip. 
So, so such systems, yes. Yeah, so they would give you memory for short stretches, but they're but they're still unstable. Uh, for example, Andy Spakovitz has a paper about this, and they saw memory for five generations, cell ge five cell generations, five cell divisions. Uh, to get to, and then I argued that essentially you need to modify, and this is a 3D model with the 3D spreading. Yeah, I do. And all the people I mentioned yeah, 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 yeah. had similar had similar problem. Again, this is a setup where you do not reinforce, you do not create. A, you, there are no pin spins. You can always create a pin spin, and around this pin spin, you would see a region of stability. That's many, many groups have done that. And so, so, but that's a different question. Like how big is the region of, how big is the marked region around a, a, a fixed collection of spins? Here, the question is like, you, 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 you flip a few spins and you want the system to memorize the pattern. So I, I guess uh, in, in order for the statement to be as strong as what I heard, you have to show that there exists no class of models, not just yours, um, that that would not produce a stable finite domain that can be transmitted to say more than five generations. And by the way, I don't know how many generations a typical eukaryote keeps transmitting this epigenetic memory. I'm not sure, is it 100 that, or yeah. more? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that statement seemed extremely strong unless you explore you know, large class of models. And to me, that seems like you had to more or less prove it as a theorem rather than say uh, that it doesn't happen. So that's what I think, I mean, mm -hmm. the strength of your statement. Yeah, okay. No, no, we're not trying to be mathematicians here. So kind of say within, within, this, within this model and exploring these two parameters, uh, there, is no, there is no stability, but it would be strange to, to get this stability. So, uh, so, so there, is, there is a more, you can think about this as a spreading of the mark in a in a in a net in a dynamic network, uh, and there are some strict results that were proven for this. But here we're talking about about something much more vague, in a sense, because this network constantly revises itself. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I think it's difficult to make a mathematical statement here. So, Leon, this is uh, Philip Sharp. Can you go back to the data where you were uh, modulating cohesion? You see transient formation of loops, and you showed uh, string signals from Nick. Ah, yes. Yes. If I have, uh, yeah, 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 I'll go, I'll go there, I'll go there. Give me a sec. I remember where it was. So uh, this was that was Fox piece, Fox three. This was me uh, somewhere here. Let me let me if it's the right presentation. It's yeah, not that one. I'll, I'll show. I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. It was just. Couple. Yeah, here it is. So, do you project the big strings there to be forming a loop between the promoter and a continuous series of sites along two megabases? I'm yeah. Just, it, uh -huh. it, and and that's due to cohesion. Yes. Okay. So this 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 is clearly due to cohesion because this this stripe completely vanishes when cohesion is depleted. And uh, what happens to Nick at that time? Uh, there are no, okay. So so there are some unpublished work from our collaborators demonstrating that that has a profound effect on the on the Mick transcription, but there is nothing published on this yet. I would say. And there are similar, there is a published paper on the sonic hedgehog with a similar stripe, not published, but there is a bioarchive showing that if sonic hedgehog is driven from enhancers located further away from the 
from the promoter. The gene itself is basically here, like me. Then removal of cohesin leads to loss of transcription of the gene. However, if transcription is driven from an enhanced located close to the gene, then removal of cohesin has no effect on transcription. So, so there is there is a bioarchive about this, a different locus. And these are transient uh, in a cell cycle, or I mean, if a cell is in G one, these are transient interactions. But these are all transient interactions. These are the same interactions that were measured by uh, in the collaboration with Anders Hansen. This is incredible. Even this dot, or the dot of the strings is present for about 20 minutes for the whole duration of the cell cycle. So these are incredible transient interruptions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So we'll <laughs> close and um, we're running just a little bit late. So thank you, Leonid, for also great discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for participating.